That's what we need, revival. Father, our country is so desperate for revival fires. Lord Jesus, our church is so desperate for revival fires. Father, we need more. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you, Father, for a people coming together and with one heart and one mouth crying out for revival fire. Oh, God, we praise you, Lord Jesus, for a people that will persevere, Father, over into the realms of your glory and over into the realms of your presence and will touch heaven and will see heaven touch this earth like never before. We'll be the vessels. We'll be the light shining forth brightly. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah on this earth today. With one heart, with one heart, one soul, one mind, crying out, oh, glory to your name, Jesus. Father, for revival fires. Oh, hallelujah. You know, I just heard as I come up here, I heard, <laughs> I heard if you trust me, then I can trust you. Obedience brings the manifestation of the glory. When we believe God, when we believe God, we obey. Believing faith is, is it, it, it produces obedience. When we believe, we obey. When we take a hold, we obey. See, Abraham, he believed God, so he obeyed. When we, when we believe God, obedience comes out of that. Oh, Jesus. When Paul was struck down by that great light <laughs> and Jesus manifested himself to him and that great light shone about him, he said, Lord, who are you? He said, Jesus, whom you persecute. Oh, when Paul got that revelation, look at the man he became. Look at who he became. Oh, Jesus, we thank you for a revelation, a revelation to your people of who you are. The reality of the God that we serve. Father, we thank you for revealing yourself to your church today. Father, as we stand in your presence and we have this awesome opportunity, Father, to come together and to worship you, Father, and stand in your presence. Lord, we thank you for the revelation of your spirit that brings forth the fruit of the earth in every one of our lives. Father, we want to see your kingdom come and your will be done in each and every one of us. Lord, that we will allow, we will allow your kingdom come, your will be done in us as it is in heaven. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for a people that will lay aside every weight that so easily does beset them. And they will begin to run this race, 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 Father. Like never before, Father, to obtain the prize. Oh, Lord Jesus, even right now that we rule and we reign with you because you're reigning. You're reigning in this earth today and you're looking for those that will participate with you. Father, I thank you for participators in this place. Thank you, Jesus, for people that have come together to participate in what you're doing, Lord. Oh, Father, every distraction removed out of our way. Just right now, people, remove the distractions. I don't care. Don't, don't get caught up and say, oh, I, I blew it. I got distracted. Just remove it right now and press in and touch heaven. Let the realms of heaven touch you. You touch heaven. Let heaven touch you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you let heaven touch you, it will take you outside of who you are and form you and fashion you in his likeness and in his image. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. We want to be like you, Jesus. We want to look like you, Jesus. We want to act like you, Jesus. We want to walk like you, Jesus. We want to talk like you, Jesus. We want to think like you, Jesus. We want to be like you, Jesus. Jesus, people. Jesus, people. Jesus, people. 
shining bright with the glory of your dear son. This is the purpose of our relationship and our fellowship with him. To live and to walk out this glorious relationship. To live it out with him. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God, for a people that will give themselves, Father, to you, that you can use them to turn out, turn this city, this county, this state, this nation upside down. Father, we won't let the things of this world run rampant. Father, but we will take authority. We will realize the authority and the power that you have given us, and we will take authority over the realms of of this world and the realms of things that are going on that are not pleasing you. Father, we will stand. We will stand, Father. We will stand in the gap. We will be repairs of the breach, repairs of the past to dwell in, oh God. Oh, hallelujah. We will let your glory be manifested in us. We will let your truth be manifested in us. We will let your righteousness be manifested in us. We will allow your holiness to be seen upon us, oh God. Oh, we thank you, Father, that the glory of the Lord is risen upon us. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. The gift giver. The equipper, he's here in the place, equipping and giving gifts. What do you want? What do you want? Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call unto me and I will answer. Call unto me and I will answer and I will show you great and mighty things that you've not known before, the things that you have not seen before. Call unto me. Call unto me and I will answer. Isn't that amazing? We ask, believing, and we receive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, that your Holy Spirit is here. Equipping, equipping the saints, equipping us, oh God. Preparing us, oh God, to be used in the morning. Not some sweet day, Father. Father, tonight in this place, equipping us to be used by your Spirit tonight in this place. Father, just downloading us with the things of heaven. To be used tonight to wake up in the morning in your glory and in your likeness and be used, Father, as your ambassador. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Father, we don't want another meeting. We want absolutely nothing to do with religion. We don't want to be here because we have to. We want to be here because we were so glad and so happy. <laughs> when they said unto us, let us go to the house of the Lord. Let us go before his presence. Oh, hallelujah. Let us go together up in unity and worship him. And worship him. And worship him. And worship him. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And, all, and, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Unity. The unity of the Spirit. The unity. All of one accord. They weren't fo focused on anything else but about what the Father was about to do. Jesus told them. They were, they were mere men like us and women like us. They were like us. They were like us. And they all joined together. And they waited. They were waiting with the unity of the Spirit. Waiting on that outpouring, that day of Pentecost to fully come. Ha, 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 ha. Glory. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. We've come into this place tonight. In case you don't know, we come into this place tonight with one accord and one mind to wait on the Father that he pour out his spirit upon us, that he equip us, that he anoint us, that he pour out his gifts upon us, that we receive of him, that we can be everything that he wants us to be, that we can live out this life according to what he wants us to live it out. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. To just let him take over. Let him take over and show forth his glory through us. In us and then through us. Whew. Glory, hallelujah, Jesus. I get excited when I think about what he's done for me. I get happy when I think about what he's done for me. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. That we don't have to live out this life. It's just mere men. Just mere men walking around hopeless and blind. But we can walk out this life in the glory of his presence, living in, in, in heaven, living in the realms of heaven, living in the realms of glory, fulfilling God Almighty's purposes because we allow him. Because we allow him to fulfill himself in us. We allow him to do his work in us. We show up and he does it. We're obedient. We say, yes, Lord, and he does it. Oh, praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. They were in one place and suddenly, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. We heard the Holy Spirit say by the prophet Philip Smithers not too long ago that he sees the wind getting ready to blow in this place. And I don't want to wait. I, I'm ready. Now, Lord. Now, Lord. Now, Lord. Now, Lord. Now, Lord. Now, Lord. Let your fire fall. We'll let your winds blow. Oh, move by your spirit, almighty God. Oh, glory to your name, Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Glory to your name, Lord Jesus. Almighty oh, God. Oh, praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. And there appeared unto them, well, I, I didn't finish, a rushing mighty wind, and, and it filled the house where they were sitting. They were sitting there. It's okay to be sitting. You can be sitting or you can be standing, but it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it said upon each of them, every one of them, not one was left out. Not one left out, Father. Not one left out. Not one person in this building on this property left out. Not one that's supposed to be here left out, oh God. Filled them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Filled them. And they began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Caught up in the realms of glory. Caught up in the realms of his presence. Let God take them outside of themselves so they could learn to follow the Holy Spirit. That is what tongues, tongues is basically the entrance over into the realms of heaven. It takes us up into that fellowship. It's where the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus in the, in the heavenly language. It, it's, it's the place that revelation comes. It's the place that prophecy comes. It, it's the place where the gifts work. <laughs> that realm of heaven, that realm of glory. Oh, praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. This is how we show up for work on Monday morning. 
Father, what are you doing? Father, what are you saying? Father, what are you declaring? Father, who have you sent me for? Father, what do you want me to do today, Lord Jesus? What are you doing, Father? Show me so I can do it with you. Lord, I want to do what you're doing today. <laughs> Woo, glory. Glory to your name, Jesus. Glory to your name, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And when Peter and John came together, they, came, they went to the temple. And the lame man got healed. He just got in their way. He got in their way, and they were about doing the father's business. And the lame man got in their way. <laughs> and they said, silver and gold have we none, but such as we have. We have. We have. Who has? Have you been baptized in the Holy Ghost? Such as we have. Such as I have give I you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up and walk, rise up and walk. And he jumped up and he went leaping and praising God. And they got in a lot of trouble for that. There was a lot of trouble for that glory being revealed on earth. Because they're like, we thought we had done away with this Messiah. We thought we had done away with this one that declared he was the Messiah, the King of kings and Lord of lords. We thought we ended it. But what they didn't know is they only began what the church was about to embark upon by the Holy Spirit. Because what Jesus completed through the death of the cross and cleansing us from our sins and gifting us, giving us the Holy Spirit and empowering us to go about and do the same work Jesus did. That's what we're here for. That is your purpose. That is your destiny. That is your calling. That is why you are on this earth, is to allow that glory to be seen and manifested through you. What they did started the glory. It just started what Jesus was going to do. It just only began. And he's looking. He's looking for those that will just humble themselves, not allow offense, not allow confusion, not allow doubt, not allow unbelief, but will allow him to come and work on the inside of him and do his perfect will through them, in them and through them. It has to be in you first, and then it can be through you. You have to receive. You cannot give what you have not received. You must receive, and then you give. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I tell you, if there's anybody in this place doing greater miracles than what Jesus did, because he said we would, then you can be exempt from this message. But if there's anybody in this place that is hungry, and saying, Father, that is for me, and I will not be left out. I won't just have a little bit. I won't have a trickle. I won't have it here and there, and sometimes, Father, but I'm going to take a hold of this glory, Father, like never before, and I'm going to run with this fire. I'm going to run with this fire. I'm going to do it. I'm going to be obedient in these few things that you've given me so you can make me ruler over many, so you can do more in me, Father God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. And they threatened them and told them not to speak any more in that name of Jesus. And I like what they said back to them. <laughs> oh. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, I'm just going to read in verse 8 of chapter 4. Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, you rulers and people, elders of Israel. This is the ones that he was afraid of and he ran and hide, hid from. These are the ones that he stood and he denied Jesus three times, but then he was filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. And then him being full of the Holy Ghost. See, it was full of the Holy Ghost. Peter was a man like you. He was a man like you, but then when he got filled up with the Holy Ghost and fire, there was the change. 
There was nothing impossible. There was no fear. There was boldness. And then with boldness, they declared the word. Then with boldness, Peter stood up and he began to speak by the Spirit. The Holy Ghost does boldness. He takes whoever you are. It doesn't matter how meek, how quiet, how whatever you are. He takes who you are, and he fills you with his Holy Spirit, and then boldness comes on the inside of you. And here's Peter. He stands up full of the Holy Ghost and said unto them, You rulers and people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deeds that we have done to this impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, be it known unto you all, And to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which which was set at naught of you, builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other name (laughs) under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned, unlearned, ignorant men, ooh, that's the kind God likes to use. Think of some of the great men of God. You can think of in the latter rain revival, some of the great men of God that, that God used in America. They were not that well educated they were not educated in secular educated education. They were not educated men. You, you look at A.A. Um, a. Allen and William Branham and, and, and all of these people. You, you, look at, um, you can look at uh, um, Catherine Kuhlman. None of these people were highly educated. Kenneth Hagin, William Branham, they said that you couldn't, you couldn't understand him a lot of times when he spoke. It was hard for people to translate for him because he said hanked and tis and, you know, that. And he, he, he didn't pronounce, he didn't even pronounce, he couldn't even pronounce his words correctly. But then, but then, here comes a person that was born with no eyes and just had slits on their face. And he said, if I'm a man of God, then this person's going to see. But if not, if this person doesn't see, then don't believe anything I have to say. Don't believe a word I have to say. And as they all stood there and they watched the glory of God, form eyes where there were no eyes. Form eyes because a man dared believe God. Not because he was educated. Not because he knew everything. Not because he even divided the word of of God rightly all the time. But because he believed God. Because he allowed God to work in him. And he dared to believe God. He would shut himself in with God. A.A. Allen shut himself in the room with God. And he, he, he was just sick of where he was at. He was sick of just church. And he shut himself in the room and he told his wife, don't open this door. He locked the door. He he gave her, he had it fixed where she locked it from the outside. And he said, don't open this door till I come out with the power of God. And he shut himself in there. And you think about it. You think about Muslim people that as they're being, taking steps into the realms of their religion, their six-year-old children, one of their parts of their religion. I heard a girl testify of this just recently, telling about how at six years old, her step, her, her step in the religion was to fast for 30 days at six years old without food or water. Food or water for 30 days over a religion that brings forth death. Thank God she found Jesus. Thank God she found Jesus because somebody at her school at the age of 16, because they had to leave, they had to leave Iran and come to the United States of America through some situation. I don't want to go into the whole story, but they came to the United States of America and they were a very strong, devout Muslim family. And 
You know, they prayed. She said, you know, at, at just a little child, we prayed five times a day. Six years old, fasting 30 days for the devil. And she said somebody in her school at the age of 16, somebody asked her to church. She said first, she said first she had just taken one of her beatings from her father, which was a regular occurrence because that is just what they do. And she had been so thoroughly beaten by her father. And that was the way of life. And she said it was just, it was just always give, 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 give in her life. And she's like, finally, she's just broken. And she says, God, if you're real, if you're real, would you reveal yourself to me? Because she'd heard about Jesus. She'd heard a little bit about Jesus. And she had heard about Buddha. And she says, Lord, if, God, if you're Allah, if you're Jesus, if you're, if you're Buddha, reveal yourself to me and I will serve you with all of my heart. But I want to know who you are. She was broken and she was done and she wanted to know reality. And somebody, some little 16-year-old girl said, will you go to church with me? And she snuck and she went to church and she knew that this was the answer for the prayer that she prayed. And she got touched by the Heavenly Father, and she asked Jesus to come into her life. She went home, and her parents found out that she had become a Christian. <clears throat> and she befriended someone communicating over, with them over the Internet, someone that was a Christian. And she said, please pray for me because my father said that if I don't renounce Jesus, there's consequences. And what that means in our religion is that I will be killed. My family will kill me. And please pray that God will give me strength to not deny the name of Jesus, that I will stand in the face of death, and as they kill me, I will be able to stand for Jesus. And that person was able to get a hold of that little girl and let her escape out of that home and come. And she is hidden in the United States of America away from her family because if she was found, she has to hide. Because if she was found, today they would kill her. She's 22 years old today and was telling her testimony about how she escaped from a religion that took, took, took and never gave anything but how Jesus gives. The glory of Jesus. How many people are waiting, are waiting for us to declare the light of the glory of the salvation? And to realize and to know that they, we are God's epistles. And we are standing there. And we are the only epistles that some people read. They have nothing else to read. They know nothing. They're waiting to see. Some people may look very busy and they may reject when you speak to them of the one and only Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. But let me tell you, his word will not return void. You declare his word and it will not return void. You don't weary in your well-doing. Because if you don't faint, you will receive the reward. You will receive the reward. You will receive the reward of your labor. And it doesn't matter if they spit in your face, they spit in Jesus' face. It doesn't matter if they slap you or they call you a name. They did much more to our Savior. <laughs> oh, much more. But there is a world waiting to see the glorious church arise and be the glorious church. Oh, hallelujah, there's a, a world waiting for our light to shine bright and his glory to be seen in us and through us. We've seen the glory of God in this place again and again and again. We've seen blind eyes open. We've seen deaf ears unstopped. We've seen cancer healed. We've seen the cripple walk. We've, we've seen everything that you can think of. The glory of God is manifested again and again in this place. And as we go out and we preach the gospel, we see the miracles and the signs and the wonders. But God has petitioned and called every one of us to go in that same glory, not one of us being left out, but all of us to walk over in this realm of his presence and the realm of his glory, declaring forth this gospel and letting his light shine bright. Oh, 
Oh, thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. God wants us to go deeper. He wants us to press in, to touch the realm of heaven. Where the things of this life, where the things of this body do not dominate us. But the things of the realms of heaven dominate us. We're not sitting here again with another yawn waiting for another service to go get over because we have something else that we must accomplish. But we're sitting here and we're beholding the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're here to hear what the Father is saying to us. We're here to be touched by the realms of his glory and the realms of his presence so he can take us up. <laughs> he can take us up into his presence and he can show us great and mighty things and declare his ways unto us that we can live it out upon this earth. It's a visitation with the Father here tonight, people. We're here to visit with the Father. We're here to behold him. We're here to see him. We're here to be touched by the realms of his presence and the realms of his glory. We're here to be changed from glory to glory. That is what we come into this place for. We come in this place to be equipped by his spirit to go out and shine bright. To go out and let his glory to be revealed. Not to go out and to wrestle with sin and ungodliness, but to go out after we come into this place and we're equipped by the realms of his presence and the realms of his glory to go out shining as lights into a dark world to bring forth the light of the glory of the gospel of our dear Savior, Jesus Christ. He wants to flow through every one of us with signs and wonders and miracles, showing forth his glory. Will we allow him? Will we allow him? Will you say, yes, Lord? Will you say, yes, Lord, here am I? Will you say, here am I, Lord? Oh, God, don't leave me out. Send me. Use me. Here I am, oh, God. Oh, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus. Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit, Father, that reveals, reveals Jesus. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're revealing your Son in this place, that you're revealing. You're revealing the realms of glory. You're revealing the presence of the very throne room, Lord, as you're upon the throne and your glory is being shown forth upon this earth. Oh, God, you're revealing your presence to us. Oh, now, oh, God, oh, now in this place, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, for this glory. Oh, praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Father, I just thank you for a visitation for every person in this place, Lord. Father, for a touch, for a touch from heaven that they will not be the same, Lord Jesus, that we will no longer continue, Father. Father, I, right now, in the name of Jesus, I break off the spirit of rebellion. I break off the spirit of rebellion. I break off the self-willed pride in the name of Jesus, the things that would hold your people back. Father, the strife, the bickering. Lord Jesus, we would that it was not in this place. So, oh God, we would that it was not in this place. We would that we not never allowed it, Father, that it was not named once among us, oh God. And, Father, right now we press in, Father, to surrender ourselves to you. To surrender ourselves to you up into that realm of your glory and the realm of your presence, Father, that you can have your perfect will and your perfect way in us. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, praise you, Father. And so then when Peter went back to the company, he told them all the things that they had done and how they threatened them and how he told them. He says, uh, whether is it up to you whether I obey God or man? He says, I, we're going to obey God. We'd rather be, obey God than man. We don't care what your threatenings are. We're going to obey the Father. And he went to the company, and they began to pray. They began to cry out to heaven with one accord, with one voice. They lifted up their voice to heaven. 
It's that unity. See, that, that, that's what the Lord is saying. We're coming into this place in unity to lift up our voice. That We go out and we deal with the realms of this, of this world. And we're shining forth with the light. And we come into this place and we lift up our voice with one accord. When all the threatening things are out there and, and, and try to uh, um, oppress us or come against us or, or, or push us back or hold us back. We come into this place and we gather up with one accord and we pray. And in verse 20, 29, I'll start there. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Now, Lord, behold their threatenings. You can say that about the enemy because some people are still stuck about what the enemy's doing. I like what Pastor Mark says. I don't know what the enemy's doing. I haven't looked under my feet lately. Realizing we need to come to that place that we realize the authority that we're in and that Jesus Christ is on the inside of us and Satan has no place. He has no place. But you know what? The scripture does say watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Watch and pray. What did Jesus say to his disciples? He said, you can't tarry with me one hour. You can't tarry one hour. You can't show up for prayer for one hour. And then he went back again and he prayed. And he came back and he found him asleep again. I don't know how many hours we pray, he prayed, but we know that Jesus went out to pray in the mountain and sometimes he would stay there all night long just praying. He didn't need sleep because he was caught up in the realm of glory. Sleep did not overcome him because he got caught up in the realm of his presence and the realm of his glory. And we know every great revival began with prayer. Every great revival. What did Jesus do when he was baptized in the Holy Ghost? The Holy Spirit led him up into the wilderness and he fasted and he prayed for 40 days. And then was tempted of the devil and then he come out with the glory of heaven. That's what fasting 40 days will do for you. If you're led by the Holy Spirit to go and hide out for 40 days. He came out. He was our example. He was our high priest. He's the one that came to show us how to do it, right? Right? And he went and hid for 40 days and 40 nights. But then he came out with the sound of heaven, with the glory of heaven. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Every revival that's ever taken place began with prayer. A people that would come together to pray. You know, and, you know, I've had it on my heart. I'm like, Lord, should we start prayer again every night? Because, you know, we were praying um, last summer. We were over in the other building, and we were praying. And we were praying, Father, call them from the east, call them from the west. Father, just cause people to come onto the property and get saved. We just ask you, Father, that people get drawn to this property. Draw them in, Father. Let your glory draw people to the property. And one day, Raphael and Anna Lynn showed up, and Anna Lynn's little sister, and I how they showed up and why they showed up, we don't know. We don't even know how they found out about it, but it wasn't, a, it wasn't a service night. It happened to be one of those prayer nights where we were praying every night, and they walked onto the property, and God has transformed their life. And so I'm like, Lord, should we start prayer again every night? And I was listening to, it would be wonderful if we all showed up for the prayer times we already have. You know, the Holy Spirit's calling us. Will we come? Are we busy? Are we too busy? With what? With what? And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching forth your hand to heal and signs and wonders may be done by the name of your holy child, Jesus. Yes, Father, your glory being seen. This is it right here. We come with all of one accord into one place. Pressing in for the realms of his presence. This is why we have prayer time. It seemed like that right there brought a little bit of a lull. The excitement kind of got a little bit. Don't go over into your head. Just say, I surrender, Lord. I surrender, Lord. The Spirit receives. See, we're we're sons. And the Father comes and he chastens the sons. Because we don't want to be illegitimate. We want to know that we're in sonship. Amen? 
And so a son receives the correction. Hallelujah. Because it's going to cause him to grow up and bring forth the precious fruit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken <laughs> where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. This is in Acts chapter 2. I'm in Acts chapter 4. This is after they had been out there getting themselves in trouble because they were doing what Jesus did. And they were threatened. And the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. What happens when you're full of the Holy Ghost? You're not timid. You don't look to your ability. But you have boldness to declare what you hear the Father say. You have boldness to do what you see the Father do. And so therefore, when you see the lame man and God points him out to you, you can say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Don't wait someday. Don't wait for someday. But now, because this is what belongs to you, this is what's yours. Just say, Father, fill me. Come together in this place with one accord and one heart. Don't let there be any schisms or schisms or, 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 or strife or bickering. Don't let there be any, anything that would hold you back, anything going on in your mind that would keep some kind of an uproar, that would keep you out of that place of one accord in one place. But come in here together to be filled up with the realms of the Holy Ghost and fire so you can go out and declare his word boldly. Boldly, that is what you're here for. You're not here for another meeting. You're here to get filled up with the realms of the Holy Ghost so you can go and show forth the glory of God. So you can go and show forth the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ to shine bright. You're here so you can learn to function in the, all the gifts of the Spirit. So you can receive of what is the Spirit's and you can live it and walk it out and you can function in what God's called you to do and to be. I feel increase. Hallelujah. I feel increase. I feel increase. Increase in this place. Hallelujah. We're not staying the same. Hallelujah in Jesus' name. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We are being rooted and grounded. We have been so saturated with the word. The word comes forth mightily here. The word comes forth powerfully here. The word penetrates our heart. We have been, we have been in our being rooted and grounded in the word. That as we take this glory and we go forth, there is none of this foolishness that can come and take us outside of being rooted and grounded in the word. And we can go forth and stand and declare his glory without getting mixed up with all the stuff so many people stood out and, and began to believe and dare to believe God and, and were used by God, but then they weren't rooted and grounded in the Word and then things came against them and, and their ministries got all whacked out of order and they allowed things that shouldn't have been allowed. But you know what? No matter where God sends us throughout the nations of the world, we will always and forever have this body of coming together and this group of coming together and a shepherd over us that God's placed over us that no matter where we go, we can come and we can be strengthened and we can be encouraged and we can be under that protection. A people rooted and grounded in the word. Now, no, now let's take that word that's on the inside of us. Some of us are so exploding with the word of God. We don't want it to be here, only here. We want it to be coming out of here like a river by the Holy Ghost. You know, he said, don't even prepare for what you're going to say when you come before them. I will put the words in your mouth when you stand before them. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we just filled up with the word, and then the Holy Ghost takes over, and he does what he's going to do. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Jesus. And the multitude of them believed with one heart. 
and one soul. One heart and one soul. This is so, this is so real and living and alive to me. Because when we moved back to San Diego after being in the ministry with my father in, in, in Texas for about seven years, and we moved back to San Diego about 17, 18 years ago, this is what God said to me. This is what the Lord told me was going to happen in the church. The Lord has showed me visions of the things that were going to happen. You know, and many people came that were supposed to be a part of what God was going to do, but they would not. They would not receive of all that the Father wanted to give. To them, every bitter thing was not sweet. They weren't hungry enough. They wouldn't lay down their life and walk it out, but there's many in this place that have walked it out. You've stuck through the fire, and now it's time to rise up in the anointing and the calling and the gifting of God that he's placed upon your life with one heart and one soul. They were so radical that neither said any of them that what they had, the things that they possessed, were their own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And great grace was upon them all. And with great power, and with great power, the signs and the wonders and the miracles were manifested. That's a church where there's one heart and one soul. We can make up our mind right now that we're going to let go of it all. And we're going to say, no matter what part of the body that you want me to function in, Father, I'm going to be there in unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. I'm going to be there, Father, with one heart and one soul. Father, crying out for the moving of your Spirit in the place. Father God, that we can go and we can see that glory where you want us to see that glory. Oh, hallelujah. Where that manifest presence of God can be like it's never been before. We've seen great things. We've seen great things. But there is so much more that Father wants to do. He wants the place to shake with his glory. He wants to send in and fill up this place with people that are in such great need. And then just signs and wonders continually and miracles happening one right after the other. But he not only wants to do that, but he wants us everyone to go out with this glory and declare this glory as we're going out to shine bright with the glory. He keeps saying, shine bright. You hear that? Shine bright. If there's any darkness, oh, how great that darkness. There can be no darkness, only light. He is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Darkness is sin. Light is righteousness, truth, and holiness. That is who he has made us. He has made us righteous. He has made us holy. He has made us pure. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Sweet Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And it wasn't only the apostles, because we can go right over there and look at Stephen, and we can look at Philip, and, you know, they were just, they were just called to serve tables. They were just called to do the business. That's what they were called out for, they thought. And with great signs and wonders, Stephen gave witness. He was a man full of the Holy Ghost. Because that's who they wanted to do the business, is men full of the Holy Ghost. Because you know what? They're going to get the job done because they're going to trust the Holy Ghost and enable them to do what they can't even do, what they've never done before. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. And I'm just thinking of the miracles, the miracles that God has used us to do. I think of when... Um, when I went to uh, the Barrio Logan many years ago. And this is, this is great miracles. There's so many. There's so many people that have been healed right here in this place. There's so many people that have been healed. You know, my, you know, my mother-in-law, just when we went there in Mississippi, she got healed. From, she had had a stroke, which left her unable to, to talk and unable to walk. And by the time we left, just a couple of weeks later, she was up getting going around cleaning her house, and she was able to write out her bills, and she was able to talk clearly, and I mean, she's completely healed and whole. That is the presence and the power of God. And I think of the Barrio Logan where there was, you know, we, we used to reach out to those children there, and we'd bring them in, and, and we would, we would, minister to them Jesus. And one of the li little girls that came, she had epileptic fits all the time. And when we went to the Barrio Logan, 
to do that crusade and reach out there to them as we were preaching the glory of God just was so powerful in that place. We knew that the gang members, as I stood there, I watched as gang members were all around the place. And, you know, because, you know, as I've told you before, I went into the places that you weren't supposed to go to invite them over to where the other gang members, that was their territory. And I just, you know, I didn't know all of that. So we were inviting all the different gangs to come together for one big crusade. And you're not supposed to tread on each other's territory. And I had no idea. So, I mean, you know, I knew, I knew by the Spirit what we were up against. And I stayed on my face for two weeks going, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. You must show up because I can't do this. Because by the Spirit, I knew it was going to take prayer and fasting and seeking God for His glory to shine up, to shine forth and show up. And I watched as a simple message of the love of Jesus began to break the hearts of those men that stood there in the different places as God drew me by his Holy Spirit to see them and, and their hearts begin to break as the message, the, the message of how much Jesus loved them went forth. And as we called the people up that wanted to be healed, that little girl that had hept epileptic fits, and she said, I'm so tired of this. I'm so ashamed of it. It seems like about every week I'm, I'm having an epileptic fit at school, and it's so embarrassing. And as, as we laid our hands on her, instantly the power of God touched her. And from that day forth, two or three years later, we heard she had never, from that moment on, never had another epileptic fit. And there was a woman in the line with an inoperable brain tumor. And the doctors had told her there's no hope, there's nothing else we could do. She was going blind and the headaches had been so bad. They were continuous, they never stopped. She lived in continuous pain and she was beginning to go blind from the tumor. And she'd had to quit her job. And she lived in torturous pain every moment of the day. And as she stood there and we laid our hands on her, the power of God came upon her and instantly the pain left her head. Instantly the pain left her head. And two or three years later, she came and she had never had another headache. She had gone back to the doctor and the tumor was gone. They could not find the tumor. And over and over again, the people that have gotten in line the people that have been raised from the dead. I looked and I saw a man that we prayed for one day related to Grace Graham, her brother, that he was on his deathbed. They were getting ready to pull the plug. And Grace said, will you go with me? And I said, I will go. And me and her and Stuart went into that room. And the Holy Spirit, he just laid there. He had every kind of, he had every kind of cord hooked up to him. You could imagine. He was just wires everywhere. And they were getting ready that afternoon to pull the plug. And first of all, his wife and her mother was in the room, and they didn't want us to come pray. So we sat out in the waiting room, and we began to talk about the miracles of heaven. I began to share with um, Grace's mother about my mother being raised from the dead, about her having a brain hemorrhage, and she was on her deathbed, and there was no hope for her. But yet, God woke her up as my dad prayed that she would be awakened out of the coma that she was in so she could make a decision about the operation that the doctors wanted to perform upon her. And how she woke up after she had been in that coma for so long, even though she, she didn't know any of her children, she didn't know her husband, she didn't know her sister, she didn't know her mother, she knew no one. She was in that coma and all the time she, it, it, was a, it wasn't a total coma. It was um, incoherence, incoherent, where she still talked. And she would tell everyone that came into the room that the Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All you have to do is follow. She would preach to them the gospel of Jesus Christ and declare the glory of God as she laid there, a woman about ready to die because of the condition that she was in, because the, the hemorrhage that she had in her brain was about the size of a, a man's thumbnail, I believe it was, or a man's pinky, I think she said. I can't remember what it was, but it was a big, it was a big uh, hemorrhage on her brain, and the blood had gone into her spine. And when they went into her spine to take out fluid to be able to do the test that they do, whatever it is, they got blood. 
And she laid on her deathbed and she declared the glory of God. But then she woke up and she made an appointment with God for her healing. She, as she woke up and she was told about what was getting ready to take place, Oral Roberts came on the television and he was going to be in Bluefield, West Virginia. And we were living in Richmond, Virginia at that time. And she says, no, I'm going to make an appointment with God. I'm not going to have surgery, but I'm going to go over there to the Oral Roberts meeting where the glory of God shows up. And I'm going to make an appointment with God that he's going to meet with me and he's going to heal me. And I'm going to be able to rise up off this bed and I'm going to be able to go raise my five children for Jesus. And she made that appointment with God, and they said, you will never make it there, ma'am. You will bleed to death. You will hemorrhage to death. You will die on the way. You cannot be moved like that. And so she had a friend that was an ambulance driver, and she told my dad, she says, get the ambulance driver over here. And they put her in the ambulance, and every step of the way out of the hospital, she was like, oh, 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 in such horrible pain. Every, every turn, every bump in the road, she would cry out with the pain in her head. It was horrific. It was all she could do. It was all she could bear. But she had that hope. She had that faith. She had that knowing that she was going to meet with Jesus, and Jesus was going to get her there, and it was all going to be well. And she laid there. They put her in the stretcher section, and she laid there on that stretcher, and it came time for Oral Roberts to go out and to, to pray for the people in the stretcher section. And she, will, she said she listened to every moment of that service with this such expectation that God was going to come and meet with her. And as Oral Roberts came over there and he read her card that said that she had had a brain tumor and that the critical condition that she was in because the doctor said even if we do the surgery we don't expect her to live but if she lives she won't live long. And that's all the hope we can give you. We're going to go in and we're going to tie off that artery. She'll be paralyzed on one side. And she'll have to live very delicately the, delicately the rest of her life. No matter, we don't know how long that is for, but we don't expect it to be long. And as Oral Roberts read that card, he gently and carefully laid his hands upon her head. And she heard that snap in her head, the same snap she heard when that aneurysm took place and her head began to hurt so bad that by the time my dad got there and found her in our home, she was totally unconscious. She heard that same snap. And she got in that ambulance to go home, worshiping and praising and glorifying God. Every bit of the pain completely gone. Every bit of the pain completely gone. She was shouting and glorifying God in that ambulance all the way home to her five children that had been dispersed throughout the country. We had been just here and there. I was staying with my kindergarten teacher because there was just no place else for us to go. We were all just dispersed because a person with five children, who wants to take all five, you know? And I remember when I came home, because I was in kindergarten, when my kindergarten teacher came to tell me and said, um, there's been a serious situation with your mother, and she's going to the hospital, and you're going to come and you're going to stay with me. And I'm like, I, you know, I'm five. I didn't know what in the world was going on. But I remember that day that I came home, and Mama's walking down the hallway, and she's holding on to the hallway because she'd been in bed a long time. I think it had been over six weeks since she had been in bed laying in that hospital, and she came walking down the hall going, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, every step of the way, every step of the way. And then I could talk about my sister Faith, and that's a whole nother miracle of how God kept um, her because when she became pregnant with my sister Faith, and the doctors absolutely flipped a switch because she had had a brain hemorrhage and no way could she be pregnant. And, oh, my goodness, did they call my dad everything but a saint because she had become pregnant with my little sister. And uh, they wanted to do an abortion. And, of course, my mother said no, but the doctor said it's the life of the mother for the life of the child, and they were going to court to overturn my mother's decision to refuse to have an abortion because they said my mother could not carry that child. It would kill her. And so they were going to do mandatory abortion in the state of Virginia many years ago, if I better not say how many. But they were going to do mandatory abortion. 
And my mother came down with yellow jaundice. She didn't feel one bit sick. But when you had yellow jaundice back then, I don't know what it's like now, but when you had yellow jaundice back then, you could not do an abortion. So, you know, my mother went into the doctor. Here she's, they say, oh, my goodness, you sure look yellow. And my mother says, there's a lot of things I might be, but yellow's not one of them. <laughs> and that was just my mother. And, um, and she wasn't. That was a fearless little woman, five foot two, a fiery woman that raised six children for the glory of God. My dad was everywhere across the country. We never knew where he was. But my mama raised six kids, and buddy, she was a general. Five foot two, and she'd tell you what to do. And uh, she had that yellow jaundice. I haven't forgot what I was talking about, but just the miracles of God. And so anyway, she had no signs of it except her skin was yellow, her eyes were yellow as far as physically feeling it. And the doctor says, oh, you better go home and put up your feet. You might lose the baby. Mom says, excuse me, isn't that what you guys have been trying to do? <laughs> and she went home and she went about her business and she kept yellow she stayed yellow until she kept the yellow jaundice. Her blood work showed yellow jaundice. She kept it, went about her business, raising the five other kids. You know how many people can go and lay in bed when you got five kids. <laughs> she kept it until it was past the time that they could do an abortion in the state of Virginia. And then she cleared right up, and she was fine. And then here came my little sister, Faith. And just miracle after miracle, we lived miracle. I could talk about miracle all day. I could talk about when we didn't have food because we were feeding people around our table. 30 people would show up for dinner because we had a ministry there. And 30, 40 people would show up for dinner. And we'd have one can of green beans and how God would multiply the can of green beans. And there would be leftovers. And the, and the mashed potatoes were multiplied. And the meat was multiplied. And it was again and again and again. We lived it. We walked it out. We saw it. We saw it. The glory of God would show, so show up and, and, and the presence of God would be so manifested in those meetings. The anointing was so powerful that you couldn't stand on your feet. You'd fall on your face and just cry out to God because His glory was so powerful in the place. But anyway, so I begin to declare this in, in the waiting room. And we begin to say, Father, in the name of Jesus, let some kind of emergency come up. So they have to leave the hospital so we can get in there and pray for Grace's brother. And we went in that room and we began to pray. And God told me to go up and to speak something in his ear. And declare something to him in his ear. And as I did, he began to try to come off that table. I mean, Grace was there. She was sticking the hanky that she had got prayed over. She was sticking that in his mouth and everything else. And, but when I, but when I uh, spoke into his ear, he began to come up off that table. And he began to move his arms. And they're like, he hasn't been able to do any of this. There's been no sign of anything. Hallelujah. And today he's alive because of it. And I could stand here and I could tell you miracle of after miracle of where God showed up, of where my little sister's baby died at three months old and God brought her back to life again because people didn't run and freak out and, and just go, she's dead. Let's call the undertaker. We called the upper taker and his name was Jesus. And he lifted her up. And she was dead as a doornail, believe me. She was like a dish rag in my hands as I took that baby into my hands. I jumped up for some reason. I had to jump up and run out of service. And here came my baby sister with her little baby at three months old in her hand. And she says, Geneva, my baby's dead. And I took that baby in my hand and I ran for some reason. I don't know why a three-month-old baby's not going to get a marble stuck in its throat, you know. But all of a sudden, I ran my fingers down her throat and there was no gagging response. There was nothing. There was no heartbeat. There was no air. There was no breathing in her body. She just was limp. She was gone. And we begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. And God brought the life back again. And she's 23 years old. And living, a living miracle of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Time and time again, God shows up so many times in this place. I couldn't tell you how many people have been healed 
We'd have to talk about it uh, all night long because so many people come into the healing line and get healed on a regular basis. But the glory of God is going to increase in this place. And God wants you to take this glory into your workplace. Stuart, Dr. Graham, I want you to come. Dr. Graham is, for those of you here that don't know, Dr. Graham is a, uh, a, a pediatrician. And so that means you are a baby doctor, in case anybody doesn't know. There could be some kids in here that don't know what a pediatrician is. And if you're a child, this is the kind of doctor you go to. But he's not just a pediatrician. Now, Dr. Graham, I want you to tell some of the miracles that have happened as the glory of God came upon you and you began to minister to your patients. And I want you to talk about that, that baby that was sick for nine months. Oh. Yeah, there was... Um <laughs> this is what you do at work. This is what you do. There was a baby who had seen all of the other pediatricians, and she was sick all the time, and the mother was in despair. And she was telling me, I just don't know what to do. She never will. She's always sick. She's always sick. I bring her in. She's always sick. She's always sick. And that day, the Spirit of the Lord just came upon me, such compassion. I just felt so, because there was nothing medically to do. It had no remedy for her illness. And I said, today, God is going to meet with you and we're going to pray for your baby and your baby's going to be well and she's going to stay well. And it just, you know, it's the boldness that the Lord gives you. It's a boldness that comes by the Spirit. It's not a boldness that, that you stir up in yourself. Because, you know, you can think really hard about how to do things and, oh, I've been here before. I hadn't been here before, and I hadn't done this exact thing before. I just looked at her and said, today, Jesus wants to show himself to be the Lord and Savior that you're looking for. So I prayed for the baby, commanded her to be well, and sent her off. And it was, you know, she's three and a half, three, three now, and she has been well. She has been well. Everything better. And I told the mother, I commanded her to go to church. I said, you need to go and you need to seek after God. And it was too far to come here from where she lives. And so I, I gave her another church she could go to. And, you know, I've been asking the Lord, what do I do? Because she just recently had another baby when she came in. And uh, so I'm praying, Lord, now you did a great work for her. And she knows it because she's testified of it to me. But we're going, to see, we're going to see her now begin to serve the Lord like she should serve the Lord. That's the next miracle that we need to see. Because that's a miracle too. There have been countless examples. But the important thing about it is that every kid that comes in, I'll lay my hands on them and I tell them to be blessed and I'll tell them that they have to be well. It's a rule in my office. If you come in and I touch you, then you have to be well. Because that's the authority that Jesus gave me. Not because I'm smarter and not because I know anything, but it's just a rule. Because the Lord said, I have authority, and I pray over them, and I touch them, and they have to get well. And that's good. I do that with just about everybody. There's lots of different situations that come up. But there are times when the boldness of the Lord comes, where you're praying, you've been praying the more you just, you, maybe you were having a bad day. It doesn't really seem to matter what I've been doing of my own strength. What matters is that you're available to the Lord, and then the boldness comes. And then you reach out and you touch them and you command them to be well. And they get well. And my partners always wonder why my, kid, my patients I see are always so much healthier. It's, it's, you know, it's not explainable. I don't have hardly any asthmatics in my office. And they go, well, how come we have so many and you have so few? The Lord touches them and they get well. And there's, you know, there's all kinds of things that people can measure, but it's, it's a boldness of the Lord. I've, I've had a mother in my office who came to me, and she brought her kids in, and her mother-in-law was there, and her marriage was falling apart, and her husband ran off with somebody else. And I just, again, the boldness and the compassion of the Lord, I said, well, we're going to pray right now, and we're going to pray that he comes to his senses, because he brought her to the Lord. That's the amazing thing. But then he ends up running off. So he's going to come to his senses. He's going to recognize he needs to repent. He's going to come back to you and tell you that he's repented and given his heart back to the Lord Jesus. He's going to, your family is going to be restored. He's going to start serving the Lord. So these things are going to happen because we're going to pray. 
So I've prayed for that specific thing. She comes back later, exactly what happened. Happened just that way. It was beautiful. She came to church here when we were in the hotels a couple of times, brought her husband once, and then she came back to my office recently. They live up in Monterey. But she came to my office specifically to tell me that her husband's serving the Lord. He's involved in Bible studies at the church that they're up in in Monterey. And she watches Pastor Mark all the time on the video. <laughs> Which I thought was so wonderful because she's serving the Lord. I mean, this is why God does these things. He does these things through us to bless people that they can come to him and receive the greatest blessing of all, which is eternal life. I mean, it's, it's just the greatest thing of all. And the miracles are that people might believe. And I can't do a single miracle by myself. I can't do anything. But the Lord will come upon you and he will give you a boldness. You read that scripture. It was the one I wanted to read tonight, which is the one where they prayed, Lord, grant us boldness by reaching forth your hand to heal and that signs and wonders be done by your holy child, Jesus. That is incredible. It's a great prayer to pray. Lord, grant me boldness because I want to see more of the manifestation of your healing. I want to see more of your signs and wonders that I might have a greater boldness to begin to command things. It's amazing how when you stand in the place of God and you command things to be, to be done, you say, you will be well from now on. And you don't draw back with, well, I'm hoping that maybe you might get a little bit better. And you might feel better, but when you have the boldness of the Lord to declare, to with authority command it to be so, I tell you, it works. When you're sitting there wondering, wishy-washy about it, I'm not sure, I prayed and they didn't get better, whatever, you're, you're thinking about it and measuring it in men's terms. When it results in somebody getting saved, when it results in somebody coming to serve the Lord Jesus, you know it was God who did it. Because that's the greatest miracle of all. And we want to see more of it, so we need more boldness. So how do we get more boldness? Can we work it up? You know, if I go work out my boldness, so it gets stronger. What can I do to make myself more bold? Well, what I can do is I can ask the Lord to give me boldness. I can say, Lord, grant me boldness. Grant it to me. Grant it. Stretch forth your hand. Do signs and wonders in this place. Do signs and wonders out there. Lord, show forth your glory. Show forth the manifestation of everything that you do. And Lord, I with boldness will preach your word. I will preach what you say. I will say what you say. I will not back down from your word. I will preach your word. I will speak your word. I will declare your word. I will not be satisfied with anything less than the fullness of the manifestation of the glory of God. So I will tell you that when that boldness comes, act. When, you, when you're touched from heaven, act. If you just walk around and you begin to pray for people and you're just saying, Lord, I have such compassion. I just see that need there. But, I, you know, I, I'm just not certain. Begin to say, Lord, grant me boldness. Grant me boldness. Stretch forth your hand to heal. And then go preach the word. And then go lay your hands on them. Go pray for them. I've laid my hands on many kids, many of them, just prayed many times. And I tell you, the miracles are great. People can explain a lot of them away. Oh, well, it would have happened anyway. And there's all kinds of explanations of men. But I tell you, when people are touched, when they're in fear, when they're worried, and when they're scared, and you touch them, and they get healed, and they get set free of that thing that was holding them in bondage, I tell you, they, they recognize it. And now they know, Lord, touch them. And now you bring them to Jesus. You say, look at what we found. So wonderful. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, um, I went to Dr. Graham's office with my daughter when her second son, Ethan, was born, and it was for his six weeks checkup. And we're, we're in the room waiting, and, and Dr. Graham walks into the room, and he sees me, and he goes, Oh, perfect, you're here. I was just telling these people over here about the Lord and what he's done. Come over here. I want you to meet him. <laughs> And so, I mean, I know what goes on in his office. He's there to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to see the glory of God revealed and manifested. He's not there to just be a doctor and prescribe stuff. He's there for the glory of God to impact people. He's at a good place where sick people are. Amen? Sick people need prayer. Sick people become very destitute at times, especially when your baby's been sick for nine months and nobody can figure out what's going on and the baby's not getting well and just sick all the time. 
And then you get the opportunity to lay your hand on that baby. And, and it's well. And it stays well. Hallelujah. And God's just looking for people that will participate with what he's doing. He just wants participation. Isn't that what the Holy Spirit said at the beginning of the year through the mouth of this prophet? He said participation. Father's talking about participation. So will we get up and we will we move and participate? Will we look at what we're doing and say this is this is all to participate in the kingdom of God. I'm showing up for work tomorrow to participate with what God is doing in this earth today. I'm going to be faithful over the few things that God has placed in my hand that I can be ruler over many things. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So we wake up in the morning excited about going to work because God's going to show up and he's going to change somebody's life. That we're going to go shining bright with joy and glory on our face. So we're a epistle read of all men. Men are looking at us and they're reading us and they're going, what is different about that guy over there? I don't know what's different about that girl over there, but I sure do like what it feels like when I get up close to her. Have you ever asked any, had anybody ask you, what is it about you? that I'm drawn to because people are drawn to the glory of God. They'll either love you or they'll hate you. The devil will hate you. He will. And when people want to keep the devil, he'll, they'll hate you. But you know what? You can cast that devil out and give him an opportunity to love Jesus. You can give them that opportunity for their mind to be set free. Because you have authority over their mind. You have authority over the demons that bind them. You don't have to be afraid when somebody's demon possessed. Just cast the devil out of them. And then they're not afraid and you're not afraid. Nobody's afraid. And then you can preach Jesus to them. We go, when we go with this authority and this boldness and we believe what God says is ours, we believe that he's equipped us with all of heaven. All of heaven is backing us up. We're not stepping out there and saying anything on our own. We're stepping out there and we're saying what Father's saying and he's going to back up his word. He's going to back up his word. His word will be backed up if we will only believe. The power and the anointing of, and the glory of God will shake this place like it's never happened before if we will be obedient to his word and we'll come in here and we'll put aside all the stuff, all the things that would distract us and we'll come in here in full participation of the glory of God being revealed in expectation of moving over into the realms of glory to be equipped to go out to show forth his glory. Yeah. Hallelujah. And people... Hallelujah. And people that have thought that they would be nothing but a teacher or nothing but a, a this or a that or whatever you do, you thought that that was your lot in life and that's what you were going to do and you were going to use what you've got to preach the gospel. God will take that as you participate with him and he'll send you to the nations of the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because it's not about you. It's about you being willing to let him, to let God, to let God. And as, as Stuart is faithful in these few things, these things that God has put into his hand to do, and he participates with that, and he moves in that, and he allows God to form him and fashion him into what he wants him to be, God is going to use him more and more. When you're faithful with a few things, he'll make you ruler over many. Amen. Amen. Whatever God brings before you, be faithful with it. Be faithful because it belongs to the kingdom of heaven. You know, and, you know the Lord just, you know, I, I just heard this. In the spirit about the little children that he gives us. He wants us to be faithful with raising those little children and bringing them under the realms of the anointing and making sure that they're filled up with the realms of the Holy Ghost and making sure that we are careful with the way that we raise them. I was talking to the women at the last women's meeting about this, and, and it, it was just a, a download that I had never really heard like this before, but that their angels are always beholding the face of God. All of these little children come into this world with an angel. You know, Jacob, you have an angel that goes with you everywhere you go. And he's writing down, basically, in a, in a spiritual realm, everything you do. And he takes it before the Father, and he talks to the Father about you all the time. Did you know that? All you young kids in here, all you young people in here, you have an angel that goes with you everywhere you go. And the angels are watching. Their angels are watching about how you deal with those children. God cares about his little children. And you don't want to slap your kid out of, out of anger because think about it. You're slapping an angel. 
of God. God doesn't take it lightly. He wants you to deal. How does he want us to live? He wants us to have the love of God flow out of us and the compassions of heaven to flow out of us. And we've all made our mistakes in that. And yes, we have to discipline our children and correct our children. But in the love of God, he wants us to function in our discipline with our children out of the compassions of heaven, out of the realms of glory. You want to raise your child up right, you raise them up with fear and trembling, bringing them to the Father in the way that you conduct yourself toward them. Because their angels are watching what you do, and your angels are watching what you do to them too. And you don't want the Father sitting there shaking his head. I thank the Lord I had my mother when she was around, and she'd correct me when I was raising my children, and she'd tell me, don't you do that, and you do this, and, you know, you do it right. I'm so thankful for that. We don't want to be puffed up and too, and too arrogant that our parents can't speak in our life, but we want to let them speak into our life because they made their mistakes, and they want to help us not make them. Amen? Amen. And that shouldn't change the atmosphere of the place because that's very important. It's very important to the Father. Our children are very important. The best thing that you can do for your children is get on your knees and pray and cry out to God for them that he will form them and fashion them and make them the person that he has called them to be. And then teach them how to flow in the Holy Ghost. When they do things bad, get them over in the realms of the Holy Ghost. Get them speaking in the Holy Ghost. Get them praying in the Holy Ghost. Get them in Holy Ghost meetings and keep them in Holy Ghost meetings. Focus, focus their attention not on what they can do on this earth, not how they can make money and not how that they can obtain to academics, but how they can flow in the Holy Ghost and they can be the man or the woman God's called them to be when they're raised up. Not focused on sports and, and this and that and so much time to academics and sports and the things of this life that they can't do anything else but, and, and when they get to church they fall asleep because they're so worn out for, from the life they live. But their focus is on church because you're preparing them to come to the house of the Lord. I used to always prepare my children to come to the house of the Lord. I would fast and pray many times before the service. I almost always fasted every Wednesday before the service, crying out to God that the anointing would show up. I usually never went a week without fasting. Since I've gotten a little older, I don't fast as much as I used to, but I, I, I'm, I, I'm thinking about a long fast. Because I want more of heaven. Just because I want to get closer over into that realm of his glory. But we'd fast and pray. I'd fast and pray on Wednesday. And then my kids, they'd be like, Mom, you're not eating. I'm like, oh, I'm praying. I'm crying out. And I'd be talking to them about what God was going to do and how he was going to show up and how the glory of God showed up and how, how his presence uh, would come down and, and his glory would be revealed. And I would bring them into the church in expectation of God touching them. A glory realm that you get, you explode in, that you can't contain yourself because I experienced that glory realm. And I'd talk to them and I would prepare them to get touched by that glory realm. This is the reason that we're going to church. We're going to church to press in, to touch the realm of glory, to see other people touch the realm of glory. And then here they are, just little kids. And they're saying, Mama, we're going to fast with you. And I'm like, no, baby, you don't have to fast with mama. You just go ahead. You eat your food. Mama cooked your food. No, mama, we're going to fast with you. All the way down to my little daughter. She was like five years old. She fasted with me. And we prayed for the move of God. We just get caught up. And we were homeschooling. This is what you do when you homeschool. We get caught up in the realms of glory praying for God to move, and they'd go in there with expectation. And during the altar time, they'd like to just get up there close to whoever was praying. You know, a lot of times Papa would be praying. My dad would be praying right here in the Biden place, would be praying for people in the glory of God. We fasted and prayed for the glory of God to show up, so he was showing up. And, it was, and we were getting touched, and it didn't matter. I mean, people thought we were crazy. But anyway... You know, they'd come to the place and they had the California education and never seen the glory of God and the move of God that takes a man and, and, and changes him and just electrifies him with the glory and the power and the presence of his precious Holy Spirit. Oh, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what people think. I love his presence. I love his glory and I want more. 
I want more. I don't care what people think about me. And so they would get up close to where Papa was, and they'd be sticking their foot through the line trying to touch his shoe because Mama had prepared him that the glory of God was going to be there. And they saw that the glory was happening and people were getting touched where Papa was praying. So they'd get over there and I'd see him. They'd get in behind him and they'd be trying to touch his shoes so they could get touched by the realm of glory. And then we'd go all the way home talking about the glory of God and what happened in the service that night and how God touched them, how they got up close and touched the realms of heaven. We'd drive one hour home touching, talking about the glory, them excited about the glory realm that they touched. And then we talked the next day about it, and then I began to prepare him for Sunday, how we were going to come into the house of the Lord and be touched by the realm of his glory, how he was going to equip us and prepare us, Father, to do more in his kingdom. Oh, hallelujah. This is what? This is what? Our conversation is heaven. You can say our citizenship is in heaven. Okay, well, we're citizens in heaven, so we're up there, and, and our conversation is right around the throne room. He's hearing what we're talking about. And I tell you what, it's a good report when the angel that that hangs around your children goes around and tells tells the father, goes up and tells the father, hey, they're talking about the realms of glory and and, and all the time. They're teaching the kids how to, uh, to flow in the anointing. They're preparing these kids to be mighty in the kingdom of heaven. This is what you want to do. Stop your business busyness that will keep you from imparting the realms of glory to your children. And to your friends and to your loved ones that are around you. This is what we live, what we talk about in expectation all the time about what God's going to do. Not about how we're going to be able to go to church and get enough rest too so we can go to work all week and not feel exhausted. You know, in the revival during um, so many revivals, but just going back to the, um, the revival in uh, Wells with Evan Roberts. Those coal miners, man, they would stay up all night. Nobody wanted to go home. You couldn't kick them out of the church. They were like the abiding place. You couldn't get them to leave. They would try to start dismissing around 10, 10 10.30. And then just a roar of heaven would come into the place and nobody could hear anything except people just crying out to God, praying in the Holy Ghost and just crying out to God to bend them and to use them and to take them deeper and just people getting saved and all kinds of things happening. And then midnight they'd try to close again and then the glory of God would hit the place again. And there was a roar from heaven. And the power of God would be manifested in the place and people would finally go home one, two, three o'clock in the morning. Somewhere in there, they would go home and they would get up at four or five o'clock in the morning and they would go to the cold mines and they would work all day and then they would come home and they'd say, let's get ready and go to the meeting. And nobody even called meetings at first, but every church was full because the glory of God was being revealed in a nation because somebody was crying out, bend me, God. Bend me, God. Somebody was desperate for the move of God. And God showed up. And I see a group of people that God has called to cry out for a move of his Holy Spirit like never before in this nation. In this nation and the nations of the world. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Oh! Oh, hallelujah. Oh, glory to your name, Lord Jesus. Glory to your name, Jesus. Oh, praise you, Father. Here I am, Lord Jesus. Here I am, oh God. Lord Jesus, I want all of me to move completely out of the way, and I want to be completely surrendered up to the realms of your glory and to the realms of your presence so you can use me. (laughs) Oh, Jesus, everybody stand with me. Everybody just stand with me. Allow the presence and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to touch you right now. Allow him to touch you right now. Allow him to launch you over into the realms of his presence. Don't just sit here and be a hearer, but sit here and be a receiver. A receive, 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 receive. Receive. 
Receive in Jesus' name. Receive in Jesus' name. Oh, glory to your name, Jesus. Glory to your name, Jesus. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. The glory of your presence, Father, in this place, oh God. Your glory, Father. Your glory, Father. Father, we say yes. We say yes. We say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. I feel like I want to read this scripture real quick. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Have faith in God. Have God's faith. Have God's faith. We don't have to have our own faith. We can have God's faith. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe shall believe that the God on the inside of them is speaking to them and saying, Mountain, get out of my way. I have, I have an appointment. I have a destination. I have a purpose from the Almighty. Mountain, get out of my way. Get moved over there into the sea because here comes the Almighty working in me and through me. Believes, believes that those things which he says shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever, whatsoever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, you desire, believe. Because you know you're hooked up with the realms of the Holy, Holy Ghost and he puts his desire on the inside of you. So whatsoever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. You shall have them. So you're flowing along in the compassions of Jesus, and you see somebody in a wheelchair. You see somebody blind. You see somebody that has never met Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You just believe God is going to show up. The greatest miracle is when somebody comes to Jesus. When somebody comes to Jesus, that's the greatest miracle. Believe and act on heaven's behalf. Behalf. You act on heaven's behalf, and Father will show up and glorify his son, Jesus. It's all about Jesus being glorified. It's all about Jesus being glorified. Hallelujah. It's all about Jesus being glorified. We don't want to play religion, but we want Jesus glorified in this place. We want Jesus glorified in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. If anybody in this place wants prayer, if you're sick, if anybody's sick in this place, first of all, I want you to come up. If you want prayer for something, you need healing. And along with that, if you've never met Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or you've been backslidden and away from God, I want you to come up. Jesus is here. He's in this place. He's here to meet with you. He's here in this place to meet with you. saints of God, I want you to pray with me. The glory of God is going to be revealed in this place. And we agree together right now in Jesus' name. We're agreeing together right now in Jesus' name. His glory is being revealed in this place right now. We're in great expectation right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 